Thank you all for your patience. We apologize for the delay in starting, but I'm sure many, many of you were stuck in the terrible traffic. We're happy that we are open and that we are so pleased to be able to gather together for this very important occasion. My name is Arthur Berger, and on behalf of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, I want to welcome the ambassadors, other diplomats from so many countries, and not just countries where the Holocaust took place, but others as well, representatives of uh, the U.S. State Department and other U.S. government agencies and national Jewish organizations. And I want to give a special warm welcome to the Holocaust survivors who have come in today because they are the heart and soul of this institution. And because of them, we are dedicating our lives to trying to make the world a better place for ourselves, for our children, and the next generations. This event, commemorating International Holocaust Remembrance Day, is being streamed live around the world. And so I want to welcome as well those viewers from across the United States and in so many other countries around the world. And this event is not the only one that's being streamed today. This afternoon, our special program at 2 p.m. on Combating Hate in Europe will also be streamed live. We ask those who would like to share their own feelings about today, their remembrances, their reflections, that they could do that and post it, please, on hashtag I remember by or hashtag memory to action. Now, as many of you know, in 2005, the United Nations established this special day to remember the victims, to honor their memories, as well as to educate ourselves about that history and the lessons that it can teach us to prevent future genocides. And today, we mark the 71st anniversary of the day that Soviet forces liberated the Nazi death camp at Auschwitz-Birkenau. Over one and a half million people were murdered there, most of them Jews. Millions more were murdered in other Nazi death camps and many others in their own villages or forests nearby. And just because they were Jews. And millions of others were persecuted and killed by the Nazis and their collaborators. We remember all of them. Now around the world today, many governments, United Nations offices are also remembering the Holocaust victims. At the same time, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's director, Sarah Bloomfield, is not with us here, but she's in Paris, joining together with UNESCO's Secretary General Irina Bakova at UNESCO headquarters for a special discussion, exhibition, and commemoration. Through all of these events today, we are clearly saying that this is a day not only dedicated to the memory of the Jews who were murdered, it is also about humanity. It is also especially about the lack of humanity during the Holocaust. Clearly, we in the United States and the rest of the international community have not succeeded in preventing genocides and mass atrocities in the post-Holocaust world. All we need to do is to see the news every day in the papers, on television, on the internet, to recognize that there is serious work to do if we intend to give meaning to never again and that all of you are here today with us, and especially the diplomats representing so many countries, this means that your nation considers this day significant to the world and to our future. We hope that all of you will join us in our pledge to do more so that the next generations will not grow up in a world where mass atrocities and genocide seem to be accepted as the normal course of events. 
Now, we are very pleased and honored to have with us today the Ambassador of the Federal Republic of Germany to the United States, Peter Wittig, who has some very special remarks to share with us. Ambassador Wittig. Honored Holocaust uh, witnesses and survivors, members of the Jewish community, honored guests, dear Arthur, ladies and gentlemen. Martin Weiss and his eight brothers and sisters grew up in a Jewish family in the village of Polana in Slovakia. When he and his family were deported to the extermination camp at Auschwitz-Birkenau in 1944, he was 15 years old. He later recounted their arrival, and I quote him, if you ever saw Bedlam, or if you could imagine hell, that must have been it. Because everybody was trying to hold on to their children. They tried to hold on to each other. On the same day, Martin Weiss, still a boy, had to let go of the warm embrace of his parents, his brothers and sisters. He was forcefully separated from the rest of his family. He was found fit enough to work. A short time later, he learned of the fate of his relatives. And I quote, we saw these big flames coming out from under a bunch of pine trees. And we could also smell flesh burning. And then we saw the chimneys the big five chimneys with black smoke coming out. And so by the next morning, when we saw those fires, we realized that all of our families were already going up in smoke by that time. I'm speaking to you today with deep humility and emotion as we pay tribute to the victims of the Holocaust. Jews like Martin Weiss' family. We also commemorate the victims of the genocide of all minorities, prisoners of war, dissidents, and many others from all across Europe. It was under the command of German Nazis that Martin Weiss' family was killed in the gas chambers and burned in the crematorium Ovens of Auschwitz-Birkenau. Millions of others were barbarically tortured, brutally murdered, subjected to forced labor or pseudo medical experience, executed and gassed. The name of my country will always be linked to this despicable crime against humanity. We must not and we will not abdicate our historic and moral responsibility for the Holocaust. The memory of the dictatorship, the war, the horrific crimes, all of it is part of our identity. We carry it inside us. We will not forget. The lessons we have learned from our history are our moral compass. They define our values today, and they resonate in the call, never again. Ladies and gentlemen, this responsibility also shapes our foreign policy. This is particularly evident in our country's relationship to the State of Israel. Its right to exist and the security of its citizens will remain no negotiable for us. Our past also makes it our duty to combat all forms of anti-Semitism, racism, xenophobia, and intolerance. We must not sit idly by while people are attacked, slandered, or injured because of their faith, their race, or color, their origin, because of their disabilities 
their gender or their sexual orientation. We are living at a time where it seems a world in crisis is becoming a permanent state. We're living at a time where Europe and at its center, Germany, is experiencing a refugee crisis of unprecedented proportions. In these times of change, where our Jewish citizens increasingly fear renewed anti-Semitism, our message is simple and resolute. Anti-Semitism has no place in Germany. Anyone who comes to our country, who wants to live amongst us, must know that we will not abide any racism, intolerance, or anti-Semitism. Ladies and gentlemen, Martin Weiss had to endure a year of forced labor before he was sent to the Mauthausen concentration camp, where he was liberated by US troops in May 1945. Since 1946, Martin Weiss has been living in the United States and serving as a volunteer at this Holocaust Memorial Museum here in Washington, D.C. since 1998. And it fills me with humility and gratitude that he, together with you, all the survivors of the Holocaust, is in our midst today. And Martin Weiss will celebrate his 87th birthday tomorrow. We who still have the opportunity to listen to him and his fellow survivors like Johanna Gerechter Neumann, we have a duty to pass on their painful history to the younger generation. Ms. Gerechter Neumann, you will speak to us yourself in a moment. I would like to say how immensely we value this. Only you can share your memories with our next generation. My country has opened a new chapter. For over 65 years now, we have been living in a thriving democracy with a vigilant civil society. Three generations after World War II, the younger generation of Germans discusses the darkest chapter in German history the Holocaust and our responsibility more than ever before. Since the wall came down, Berlin has evolved into one of the fastest growing Jewish community in the world. The flourishing Jewish life in Germany is for us an enormous gift, a gift we deeply treasure. It enriches our culture. We are grateful for this fresh start, for this newfound trust. We know it will be our special responsibility to do our utmost to prevent genocide in the future. We owe that to Martin Weiss and to all he suffered, to his family and to all those courageous men and women who stood up against the Nazis. And we owe it to those who were driven into exile and subjected to forced labor. And finally, we owe it to the growing number of Jewish citizens who came back to live in Germany and enrich our country. We Germans today share your pain and the memory of the unspeakable horror. But most importantly, we share a vision for our common future. Our confrontation with the past is the moral compass that guides our actions so that Jewish citizens can live in peace and security in Europe and everywhere in the world. I thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Wittig, for such stirring words, which I know come right from your heart. We will now hear from Johanna Newman, who is a Holocaust survivor, who 
is part of our family here at the museum and who has a very special story to tell because she was born in Hamburg, Germany, but was saved with her family through unique circumstances. Joanna? A little bit high for me. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for coming. Um, yes, my story is a little bit different from the tragic stories that we have been listening to and knowing of for the last 70 plus years. I was born in Hamburg, Germany, to a rather old Ger Hamburg family, not just German, Hamburg family. And very patriotic, as all German Jews were. My father had volunteered to fight in World War I, had become an officer, and as far as he was concerned, he was very much a German. With the advent of Hitler, he certainly thought that that could never happen in Germany, this could never happen to him, this could never happen to the people who had given their lives. In fact, he had lost his younger brother 18 days before the end of World War I. Well, we do know that it did happen, slowly, but it did happen. And so after November 9th to the 10th, the November pogrom, or colloquially known as Kristallnacht, my father, as well as everyone else, had to realize and understand that there was no longer a place for Jews to live in Germany. Reluctantly as it was, my parents, together with friends, began to look for an asylum, where to go. Yes, they did want to come to America because we did have family my mother had sisters already here in, in the United States, but America had a quota system and you had to wait until your quota number came up. Not wanting to wait in Germany until the numbers would come up, we looked, they looked for an asylum. I wish I knew more details of how they found out about Albania but somehow they found out that the only Muslim monarch in Europe had given orders to his embassies all through Europe to issue visas to any Jew who wanted to come to the country, Albania. My parents went to Berlin where the embassy of Albania was located. In fact, it became known that King Zog had already negotiated since the early 1930s to settle Jews in Albania. And they came back with visas very shortly. My parents decided that that was it. And we together with another family, friends of ours, went to Albania. The truth is we had no idea what to anticipate. We didn't know anything about the country except that they accept the Jews and that was enough for us. We landed on March the 1st, 1939 in Duras on a very rainy, sad day. However, we were received by some other German speaking Jews who already were living there, which is something we did not know. And it turned out that during 1937, 38, 39, many Austrian and German Jews had indeed received visas and had indeed come to live in Albania. Now I have to tell you that from day one, we were received by the Albanian people like visitors. We were never made to feel that we were refugees. 
we were received with open arms. We were their guests. Albania, the Albanian people, I should say, live by a very high moral standard. Besser. Better means the word of honor. If I tell you that I am going to save you, then no matter what, I'm going to save you at the cost of my or my family's life. Besser cannot be bought and besser cannot be denied. We immediately had a good number of Albanian friends. We were invited to their homes. Everyone knew that we were Jews. I think at one time we were probably maybe a total of 100, over 100 Austrian and German Jews. People did get visas to go to America. Unfortunately, some people got visas or whatever to go to France or to Holland, and we know what happened to them. But the core group remained together for six and a half years. We lived in uh, homes mostly of Muslim Albanians. Everybody knew that we were Jews. There wasn't such a thing as ever denouncing a single human being. There wasn't one deportation. In 1941, Germany occupied the former Yugoslavia. The Albanian people opened the border in Pristina and allowed as many Yugoslavian Jews to cross the border into Albania. The uh, high commissioner or general, whatever he was, of the German people, of the German army, excuse me, knew for whatever reason exactly who had crossed the border, demanded that the Albanian government now, I have to emphasize that Italy had occupied Albania in April 1939, and King Zog and his family became refugees themselves. But the Ministry of the Interior of Albania remained in the hands of the Albanian people. It was never taken over by the Italians, as well as by the Germans. They left it in the hands of Minister Kruja. Um, the German uh, general in Belgrade demanded that all the Jews who had crossed the border, and for some reason he had the list of the names, be returned within 48 hours. The Albanian government said, oh yes, of course, we're going to find them, yes, of course. In 48 hours they managed to hide these people, and there were a few hundred of them, if not a thousand, into Albanian homes, into Alba villages. Among the people, they gave them Albanian papers, Albanian uh, names, clothing. The women covered themselves up, like Albanian women did at that time, Muslim women did. And those that they could not quickly enough uh, find homes for, they put into a hospital and wrote on the hospital, quarantine, typhoid fever. Nobody would, of course, enter that hospital for fear of infection. These people were all saved and eventually went in, were taken into what is called the old Albania. They came into Kavaya, they came into Duras, they came into Tirana, etc. All of these people were saved. There's a family, and I happen to have been friends with one of their daughters, and we de did reconnect after the war. Their name is Toptani. Uh, that family hit no less than 26 members of one Yugoslavian family, Jewish family. It is extraordinary what the Albanian people did. They showed courage that many other 
nations than the other people did not know. I do not want to deny for one minute that there were many countries in Europe where on individual basis, including churches, hit Jews and saved Jews. But they had to fear that they might be denounced by both their governments and their neighbors. This was not the case in Albania. The government and the people cooperated 100% to save the Jews because that is their way of life. You are a guest in my home, and therefore you must be saved. My home means also my country. And so none, not one of our people were ever denounced. In our own uh, case, and I do want to honor my own family, I mean uh, rescu uh, the rescues of my family, uh, their name was Pilku. I had the good fortune to still meet the young man, the son, who was my age. We, my mother and I, during the German occupation, were living in their house. Imagine that. Now, Mrs. Pilku was originally from Germany. Her husband had studied in Braunschweig and met her and married her and brought her back with him. Therefore, she had many German soldiers, officers, who visit, visited her. Imagine, she had the courage to introduce my mother and me as relatives from Germany visiting. Anybody, anybody who would have even said, oh, these are Jews, the whole family Pilku would have been killed on the spot. This is what it was. The courage, the fortitude of these Albanian people cannot be emphasized enough. Their moral standard is the highest among the nations. They didn't care. We lived in the home, and I have to say that when we came to Albania, the, uh, the population was somewhere around million, million and a half. At the time, 85% were Muslims and the rest were either um, Greek Orthodox or Catholics. It didn't matter. They lived by the same standards. They all lived by the same standard. A, you are a guest and a guest has to be saved. A guest in our house is a guest, period. No questions asked. We lived in the home, for example, of a, um, a Muslim policeman. And um, it happened to have been the time of our Passover holiday. And he asked whether he could participate in our Seder evening. My father said, of course. He was very much interested to learn of the exodus from Egypt. Well, we lived in his home maybe for a few months' time. We moved a great deal. This I have to emphasize as well. And uh, many years later, when the partisans occupied Albania, the Germans uh, were defeated, um, we were told by the partisans to leave our home where we were living because it was just across the street of so-called the border. On the one side of the street, the Germans were holding out. On the other side, the partisans were. And my parents had gone back to our home to pick up a few necessities. And we were staying with the family who were living a little bit outside of town. Well, the shooting started in the middle of it all. And my father, of course, in German, said to my mother, she should lie flat on the ground. And a partisan woman, soldier, heard this and she thought, ah, now I got some German spies. She arrested them on the spot and took them to the nearest police station, military station. And lo and behold, the policeman who participated in the Seder 
evening in my home, in his home rather, with us, he was in charge of that military outpost. He gave them the familiar Albanian hug and kiss and sent them off with a, with a uh, guard and said, don't move until this is all over. Next time I may not be around. I have to really emphasize and re-emphasize Albania, the small country in the Balkans, saved the morality of the world at the darkest hour of history of, of, of mankind. What they did is immeasurable. I'm standing here today in front of you. I can tell you that I have four children. I have 14 grandchildren and I have 16 great-grandchildren with one on the way, which would not have happened had it not been for the Albanian people. And here, what we are saying in, from our Talmud, he who saves one life is as though he saves the world. Thank you very much. And thank you, Johanna, for sharing your testimony, your life story, um, and the fact that you have wonderful children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren to really to tell the world this important story. We are now very pleased to have a short musical interlude that is going to be performed by Jacqueline mendels Bern, who is a Holocaust survivor herself, and volunteers at the museum with Gemmer Kaupers, Jean Rosenthal, and Carl Teter. Carl Tretter. They're going to be playing now the hymn of the partisans. That has great meaning, especially to survivors. It was written in the darkest days of the Vilna Ghetto in 1943 by Hirsch Gluck. And this song later became an anthem of Jewish partisans and Holocaust survivors and is traditionally sung or played in Holocaust Memorial Day services.
thank you for such beautiful music with deep meaning for all of us. Five young people from Bringing the Lessons Home, a section of the museum that trains young people to become docents and to learn the history of the Holocaust, they bring the lessons home to their communities and schools. They will now come here and they will read the names of victims of the Holocaust. The names they will read were members of the families of Holocaust survivors who joined us today and others who were not able to make it because of the weather. Let me ask Raquel Donnelly, Nia Downing, Winston Dunkley II, Graciela Griala, and Sharon Mazo to please come here. When they complete the reading of the names, David Newman will come up, a Holocaust survivor, husband of Johanna Newman, and he will lead us in the Kaddish. First, the names. Manus Bayer and Sarah Bayer, Bertha Friedman and Ari Friedman, Shmuel Karpik and Rosa Karpik, Clara Gareb and Mariska Tosig, Gita Frieder and Rosalia Frieder, Esther Toledano and Aramosa Benaderet. Solomon Birnbaum and Kurt Oberlander, Pinkas Galperin and Rachel Leah Galperin, Apollo Grunwald, Laszlo Grunwald, Ita Grunbaum and Figa Grunbaum, East Hawkhurst Greiner and Figa Soschkeimer, Adolf Kahn and Hetty Kahn. Sylvia Deutsch Bosch and Solomon Bosch, Joseph Rosenthal and Regina Rosenthal, Baron Chapon and Miriam Zilverberg, Norbert Meisner and Charlotte Meisner, Eva Munzer and Leah Munzer. Olga Streiber. Litman and Erica K. Ir Shabe, Letterer and Andre Kornhauser. Avram Ponzak and David Ponzak. Abraham David Ben Ephraim Fischel and Wolf Mirbaum. Esther Spicer and Eliyahu Ari Wax. Kata Lemberger Rosenfeld and Adolf Rosenfeld. Bertha Strauss and Brunhilde Strauss. Anna Knoll and Holda Drimmer. Edith Fogel and Gershon Fogel. Jacob Weiss and Golda Weiss. As David Newman comes up to lead us in the Kaddish, I'd like to mention that for over 1,000 years, the Kaddish has been a special prayer of mourning in Jewish communities all over the world. Please rise, and the Kaddish will be followed by a moment of silence. Thank you. <laughs> וימליך מלכותי, בחי יכון וביום יכון ובחיי דכל בית ישראל, בעגלה בזמן קריב ואמרו אמן, יהי שמי רבה מבורך לעולם ולעולמי עולמיה. יתברך וישתפך ויתבער ויתרמם ויתנשא ויתהדר ויתעלה ויתהלל שמי דקודשה בריחו. לאלם אין כל ברכתה ושירתה, תוש בחתה ונחמתה, דאמירן בעולמה ואמרו אמן. יהי שלמה רבה מן שמיה וחיים טובים עלינו ועל כל ישראל ואמרו אמן. 
עושה שלום במרומיו, הוא יעשה שלום עלינו ועל כל ישראל, ואמרו אמן. The string quartet will now play the hymn Anima Amin, I Believe. It is sung traditionally during the Jewish High Holidays, but also it has deep meaning for survivors and their families. As many Jewish victims sang this mournful song of very deep faith as they were forced into the gas chambers at Auschwitz-Birkenau and other Nazi killing centers, just as they were being murdered in mass graves near their home villages or in the forests of Europe or slave labor camps or places of torture and imprisonment. The musicians will play Anima Amin twice. First, we'd like everyone to stand and listen to it. The second time, ambassadors, senior US government officials will lead the Holocaust survivors in the lighting of memorial candles and they will be followed by other diplomats and all of our other guests.
we invite everyone to join the ambassadors and survivors and others in lighting the memorial candles.